He loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them.
surrendering all, surrendering all, and find me here, Lord, as you draw me near, just before you, just before you. I surrender Trench my soul's mercy and grace unfold a hunger and church and worship you um lord i just pray for this uh, this time of of listening to Igor preach and um there's all that we're going to learn god i pray that you would bless it that you would help us to have ears to listen um god soften our hearts um and we just thank you god that we get to come here we get to worship you we live in a country where we can uh, just praise you and may your name be glorified tonight amen all right you guys how's it going I, I am great. I have missed you so much. I haven't been here for three weeks. And um, I told the guys this story. I watched last service on YouTube, and you know that little five-minute intro thing that plays, that little video? Well, I turn it on the YouTube, and that thing starts playing, and my heart is here, man. <laughs> That's home. Um, so, two weeks ago... Uh, my wife and I, uh, we gave birth. By we, I mean, <laughs> by, by we, I mean she gave birth and I was just getting out of the way and not <laughs> trying to be in the way. Um, yeah, we gave birth to a beautiful baby boy, Benjamin, uh, eight pounds, four ounces, 20 and a half inches long, a man, a man. <laughs> um, and I was thinking about it, and we had some fam- we had family come over after, and we had friends come over after, and I was thinking about the church. And uh, you know, there's sometimes people ask you to pray for something, and 
Uh, you might pray in the moment or you might pray later, but then every once in a while, um, that person pops into your head. Has that ever happened to you? Like you're just doing something and then that prayer request pops into your head. And um, well, those of you who maybe know and maybe don't know, uh, we were pregnant once before and we, we had a miscarriage with our first child. Uh, it, wasn't, it was a hard time. Um, but God was faithful and God has blessed us. And so, man, if you have ever, like if we ever popped into your head, because I know I've asked for you guys to pray for us, if, if you have ever uh, that popped into your head and you've prayed for us, man, thank you. Thank you from, from me, from my wife, because it was such a beautiful experience to get to see uh, how the church comes together. And um, that's my uh, thanks to you. And so we get into preaching. <laughs> uh, those of you who it's your first time, I see some new faces. My name's Igor. I preach every once in a while here. Um, and if you've been with us at any amount of time, we've been going through the Gospel of Luke. We're looking at Jesus' life, and we're looking at how Jesus lived and how we are to follow him as a result of him uh, living this life. How are we to live our lives in light of how Jesus lived his life? And so if you have your Bibles today, we're going to get into Luke chapter 5, verse 36. And as Misha said before, it is about shirts and it is about wineskins. Um, so I'm going to pray and then we will get into the text. Father, we thank you for the grace that you've given us. We thank you for this time that we're able to gather here together as a church, that we're able to open up your word, that we're able to receive it. And Holy Spirit, I pray that as we read, as we consider the things that you have for us, God, I pray that you work in our hearts, that you stir up our affections for you, that you stir up our hearts for you, that we would be glorifying you and worshiping you, not just today, but throughout this week, God, as a result of your word today. And that's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, Luke chapter 5, and we're going to begin, I guess, with 36. And so verse 36, he also, that's Jesus, told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine, skin, new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. So, if you were here last week, Paul talked about fasting. And that's because earlier in the text, what happened is the Pharisees came to Jesus and they asked him, hey, why aren't your disciples fasting? Because John's disciples are fasting, the Pharisees' disciples are fasting, why aren't your disciples fasting? And Jesus told them, well, basically, they're not fasting because I'm here. Right, They have access to me. The bridegroom is here. They can come to me whenever they want. They can ask me when, whatever they want. But there will be a time when I will be gone. And in that time, they will pray and they will fast and they will seek me. But the bridegroom is here. He is already here. And so afterwards, Jesus begins to tell them this parable. So if you don't have any church history, or maybe you have very little church history or church background, a parable is a small story or a small illustration that explains something that Jesus wants to teach. It was one of his, uh, like, it was the number one teaching tool that he used uh, to teach people. It was a, a parable. It would be a short story. And every time uh, you read in your Gospels, you read Jesus' teaching, they will always say, and Jesus told them this parable. And he never just randomly told a parable. He told parables because he wanted to show them a point about what he was teaching. And so every time you come across a parable, you got to go, what is the context? What is Jesus trying to say in this parable? 
And so when you encounter the parable, and as we just read, what we just read was a parable, we have to understand the context before we can get into the parable. And so in Luke chapter 5, there are five scenarios or five events that Jesus went through. It was the call of the first disciples, then it was healing the leper, then it was uh, healing the man who was paralyzed, then it was the call of Matthew, and then it was the question about fasting. And so these five events, and you look at these events and you go, man, well, they don't really have too much in common, but in fact, if you look deeply into them, they have one thing in common. And in order for us to understand this parable, we must understand the context of this chapter. And in order for us to understand the context of this chapter, we have to understand the history that led us up into this chapter. And so, give me five minutes, I will try to explain the history of the world (laughs) as it is in the Bible. And so, God creates the world. He creates the world in six days, and on the seventh, he rests. He creates the world, steps back, and says, everything is good. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, the first two people, sin against God, and it fractures everything. That's what theologians call the fall. But it's not just Adam and Eve who sinned. Every single person who was born after them, including you, including me, including our parents, including the generation before us, including the generation after us, we have all sinned against God. We have all walked in rebellion against God. We have all rejected him. And at one point in your life, you were in rebellion against God if you are not right now. And so in Genesis 3, we see the fall. And as the centuries continue, people begin to have even more hatred towards God, even more hatred towards the things of God. Their sin only increases where God says, I have created man and all they do is sin and have evil hearts continually. And so God destroys the world, but he saves Noah and his family. He destroys the world with a flood. And then a few moments later in Genesis 12, it's actually years later, in Genesis 12 we read, God calls Abraham. At that time, he was Abram. And he calls him and he says, go out of your father's land and I will make you a new nation. I will give you so many descendants that you will not even be able to count them. And so Abraham obeys God. It's credited to him as righteousness and he goes. And then Abraham gives birth to Isaac, and then Isaac gives birth to Jacob. And then Jacob has this moment in his life where he wrestles with God. And afterward, God names him Israel. He gives him the name Israel. And so Jacob becomes Israel. And in fact, this word Israel means to wrestle with God. And so now Jacob has... is is Israel, right? So same dude, he gives birth to 12 sons and those 12 sons, they become the 12 tribes of Israel. Those sons, they betray uh, his second youngest, Joseph, and they sell him into Egypt. They sell him as a slave. They enslave him into Egypt. Joseph is sold into slavery and he spends his time there God is with him throughout, and a great famine hits the land, right? We all know what famine is. It's it's hunger, right? They had no food. But Joseph knew ahead of time, and he stored it up. And so, to make the long story short, Israel and his sons, Jacob and his sons, they come into Egypt. They are reunited with Joseph, and they are in Egypt until they die. Well, 400 years after Joseph dies... Egypt begins thinking, man, these Israelites are increasing like crazy, like they're having babies left and right, they're growing in multitudes, like we can't control this. And so Egypt, as a result of that, enslaves Israel. They enslave the people. And so God's solution is to call a man named Moses. He says, Moses, I am going to use you. You will go to Pharaoh and you will set my people free. To make a long story short, Moses goes and he sets the people free. You're all following with me, right? Because we just went from Genesis 1 to Exodus like 15. (laughs) Okay, and so Moses leads the people out of 
Egypt, out of slavery. And as they are about to go into the promised land, the land that God has promised his nation, his people, God takes Moses to uh, Mount Sinai and he gives Moses the law. And so there you have it, from the creation to the law. And this law was given to the people, and here's what the Apostle Paul in Romans 7 said about the law. So this is in Romans 7, uh, verse 7. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. You see, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. And so Moses' point about the law was that God gave people the law to show that they are sinners. God gave people the law as a diagnosis that they are sinners. So right now, if you were to go to the doctors, and let's say you had some illness, and they did a nice little x-ray on you, and they put it up, and the doctor said, you know, here's what's wrong. Well, he hasn't done anything to fix it. He's just revealed to you what is wrong. Same thing is with the law. When God gives the law, it is a diagnosis that you can go, hey, something is wrong here. And you can take the Ten Commandments. You don't even have to do the whole law because you can take the Ten Commandments and you go, man, have anyone lied here? Raise your hand. Anyone ever told a lie? And you're going, man, you're a liar. Have any of us ever coveted something that belongs to someone else? Have any of us ever been um, happy when something bad happens to someone we don't like? Right, that's another way of putting it. Or have you ever been sad when something good happens to someone you don't like? That's another way. We have covet, we have that in our hearts. And so has anyone ever stolen something? Right, majority of hands go up. Has anyone ever committed adultery? Well, here we might not have as much hands, except what Jesus said, if you look upon a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery with her in her heart. Have you ever murdered anyone? (laughs) Careful there. And you can go on, and you, and you can go through the Ten Commandments. Have you ever dishonored your father and mother? Have you ever forgotten that on the Sabbath you are to worship God? Have you ever misused the word? Uh, have you ever misused God's name? Have you ever um, put something before God? Have you ever put an idol before God? Have you ever had a God before God? Have you ever worshipped something besides God? And you go one through ten, and you fail at every single one. And I'm not just preaching at you, I'm preaching at myself. I go one through 10 and it's an F right across the board. And so the law was given to people as a diagnosis, this sort of thing that, hey, here's my standard, here's my righteousness. And we just went through the 10 commandments. We didn't go through the whole law. And this diagnosis was to show that you are sinners before God. But people took the law And what they said is, is, hey, as long as we do some of these things that God has, as long as we do them, we'll have right standing before God. It will be a type of salvation for us. As long as we follow these rules, we'll be fine with God. And God would look at that and he says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Listen, God isn't after you being a morally good person. All right, look. Look look up and understand this from the sermon. God isn't after you being a morally good person. That's not his end goal. God is not after you doing good things. That's not his end goal. You can honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. God's goal, God's great calling is to have a relationship with you. He is after your heart. He is not after you begrudgingly submitting to him. He is after your heart. He is after a relationship with you. And what the people said is, man, we can do these things and then he'll just leave us alone. But that's not what God's after. 
And so you go, okay, that's a great story. That's great that we see from Genesis to Exodus. We see what God has done, but how does it relate to anything that this parable says? And so let's kind of get back into the parable. Again, um, remember in Luke chapter five, I said there were five scenarios. There are five events um, that Jesus is in. It's five events that happen in his life. And here's uh, what all of them have in common. All of them have in common, Jesus is pushing back against this way of thinking that if you just do what he says, you have right standing before God. He's pushing back against this idea that you, by your works, by your actions, you can be saved. That by your actions, you can have salvation with Christ. Jesus is pushing back against this idea because when he calls Peter, he calls Peter and Peter says, Lord, depart from me for I am a sinful man. And Jesus is like, hey, you follow me because it's exactly who I'm after. And when we see him with the leper, again, the old way, the old teaching was to cast out lepers, do not come into contact with them. It's a contagious disease. And Jesus comes up to the leper and he brings a new way of healing to the leper. And when he meets the paralyzed man and he says, man, your sins are forgiven, And the Pharisees ask, who can forgive sins but God? And Jesus says, that's exactly who I am. I am God. I have authority to forgive sins. Here, watch me heal this leper, or paralyzed man. And then when they come and Jesus calls Matthew, or Levi in your Bibles, is the same guy, two different names, that he calls Matthew... And Matthew's a tax collector, and he's eating with these tax collectors and sinners. And the Pharisees look at that and go, man, we are so much more righteous than this guy. This dude is eating with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous to repentance. I have come to call sinners. And so he's pushing back against this old teaching that by your works, by your actions, you can save yourself. You can receive salvation. You can receive right standing before God. And so now that we have this as the context, now if we have this kind of teaching as the context, let's read that parable one more time. Luke chapter 5, verse 36. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wineskin into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. Now this first one, this first part of this parable will be really hard for us to understand because um, we buy clothes with holes already in them, (laughs) right? And so I saw this thing. um, It was ridiculous. I think it was on Twitter. So this part is gone, and all that remains are the sides. You guys see those? You see those jeans? It's, it's not jeans, man, right? You see, and, and so we buy clothes with holes already in them. Well, there was a time in human history, literally at any point before now, when having holes in your clothes was not a good thing, right? It, you had to get rid of it. And so here's what Jesus says. You have two garments, you have two shirts. One is old, the other is new. One has a hole in it, the other one is good. How stupid would you have to be to cut out a hole in the new shirt that has no holes in it and patch up the old shirt it's not going to match it's not going to and you have and you have a hole in your other shirt right it makes no sense and same thing jesus does and he brings up an example with the wineskin so Again, this might be hard for us to understand because we have bottles. And so back then, what they would do is they would pour wine into wineskins made out of animal skins. Um, And so when the wine was fermenting, the skins would expand. And if it was new skins and new wine, it would hold. But if you took old wineskins that had already expanded and you put the new wine in and it begins to ferment and it begins to expand and it will burst the old wineskins because it has already expanded and now you've 
ruined both things, right? You've ruined the shirts and you've ruined the wine and you've ruined the wineskins. And so you've ruined it. And now what? The point that Jesus is making is that he brings something completely new. This old way of living, of trying to earn your salvation by works or trying to uh, be good enough or obey the law, this way that the Pharisees thought that they had right standing before God because of what they did, Jesus comes into that and says, I have brought something completely new. And the new that I've brought, you can't mix with the old. You can't mix the new shirt with the old shirt. You can't mix the new wineskins with the old wineskins. What I bring, what Jesus brings, is completely new. And what Jesus brings is not a better version of Judaism. What Jesus brings is not a better version of yourself. And so if you try to mix the old way of, hey, by my works, I can earn my salvation. By my works, I can have right standing before God. By what I do, I can achieve salvation. And you try to mix in Jesus into that, you have nothing. You've ruined both. You have not achieved salvation here, and you have not accepted Christ. Because Jesus brings something completely new. And so in a room this big, we have many different people here. Some of us have come from overseas. Other of us have come from across the street. (laughs) Some of us, right, we all have different stories. We all have different backgrounds. Some of you grew up in church. And some of you might have grown up with this thinking, being very legalistic of, hey, let me just do what I'm doing and God will leave me alone. And some of you grew up not even caring about God. Some of you grew up not even wondering if there was a God, not even thinking or acknowledging, hey, is there even a God? Right, we all come from two different backgrounds, and yet some of us are still here, and maybe we were, or maybe we still are, battling with addiction, battling with lust, battling with anger, we're battling with uh, coveting, we are battling with sin in our life, we are trying to be someone who we are not actually, we are playing someone fake when we are someone completely not the person that we are here today, right? Some of us might still be going through that today. And so my question to you, isn't it great that Jesus offers something new? No matter what your past is, no matter what your old teaching is, no matter who you are or where you've come from, isn't it great that Jesus offers something completely new than what your past experience has been? And you go, man, but you don't know where I've been. Yeah, you're right. I I might not. But isn't it great that Jesus offers something new? You don't know what I've done. Yeah, maybe I don't. But isn't it great that Jesus offers something new? You don't know who I've been with. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know the things I've seen. If you knew, you wouldn't accept me here. And I tell you, man, isn't it great that Jesus offers something new? Jesus offers something new. He offers something completely new. Something so new that no matter what your past is, it has been forgiven by Christ on the cross. And you can walk in newness of life. So I want to look at three things today that Jesus offers us. Three things. Three completely new things. The first is Jesus offers a new covenant. Hebrews 9.15, you can go ahead and open up Hebrews 9.15 and we'll give it some time and read together. Therefore he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant. 
so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So two different covenants, right? Jesus offers us a new covenant. The first covenant given by the law from God to the people, to God's people, was that you were to have a priest and when you sin, this priest would come in and he would offer sacrifices on your behalf. And he would offer animals as a sacrifice mostly. And this would be for the people, for their sins, and he would be doing it continually. Now in the second covenant, Jesus offers himself as the sacrifice. Right? This is why we say Jesus is the Lamb of God. He offers himself as a sacrifice. And so God's wrath cannot be satisfied by animals. But the sacrifice that Jesus pours out on the cross with his blood, this is a sacrifice that is acceptable to God. This is a sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of God. And so Jesus offers you a new covenant. In the old covenant, people would think that by their works they might be saved. In the new covenant, we are saved and we work. In the old covenant, you would think that the grace of God can be earned. In the new covenant, you receive the grace of God and you are accepted. In the old covenant, you would work to be accepted by Christ. In the new covenant that Jesus offers, he has already accepted you and you are now with him. And Jesus offers us this new covenant. And so we come to him, not after we clean ourselves up. You remember what uh, Anna read before we began worship, Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, but God through Christ made you alive. And Romans 5, 8 tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not after you had cleaned yourself up, not after you got your lust in order, not after you got your anger kind of uh, yoga out or whatever, not after this sort of fixing myself up and then let me come to Christ. No, Christ saved you at your worst. When you were in rebellion against him, he loved you so much that he gives you this first covenant to be with him. Number two, Jesus makes us a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so in Christ, we are a new creation. We have the old covenant has passed away and the new covenant has been offered to us. And once we accept Christ, once we accept the new covenant, we are a new creation in Christ. Once you have believed in Jesus, you are a new creation. Don't miss that in Christ. Not everyone is in Christ, therefore not everyone is a new creation. But if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. And when I understood this, this gave me such peace, and I hope it will to you. A new creation means that you are completely new. You're not a better version of yourself. You haven't just cleaned yourself up a little. No, Christ makes you completely new. Because let me say it again, God isn't after you becoming a morally good person. He isn't after you becoming and doing good things. That's not his ultimate goal. Yeah, it happens along the way, but that's not his ultimate goal. His ultimate goal is to have a relationship with you. He doesn't want you to submit begrudgingly to him. The example I can use, um, and I can't do this anymore because I'm married, but you guys, those of you who aren't, you might be able to. When your parents ask you to clean your room and you just throw anything into the closet, Right? Has anybody done that? And so what is that? 
Well, you've done what they ask, but you haven't really done what they ask. You're just submitting to them begrudgingly. You're just saying, hey, let me just get this out of here so that I can get these people off my back. Right, and that's not what God's after. He's not after, hey, let me just do some of these things. Let me just read my Bible three times a day. Let me just do this really quick. Let me just pray here. Let me sprinkle in a little bit of church and get God off my case. That is not the relationship that Christ wants with you. That is the old way. That is the old teaching. That's the old garment. That's like mixing the two garments. It doesn't work. What Jesus offers is completely new. It is a new creation. You are in Christ a new creation. Oftentimes you hear this testimony, um, especially from, well, anybody. Uh, you, you hear this testimony of, man, what, before Christ, I was a complete drug addict. I mean, I was passed out on heroin, and I had so much uh, alcohol in my system. But then when I met Christ, all that went away. And when you hear that testimony, you go, man, praise God. And you hear it a lot, and people sort of uplift this testimony of, this is a great testimony. And it's a good testimony. But if your experience or all that you see is that you were once a druggie, and now you are not, and that's what Christ did for you, you miss the mark. Like, it's good. I'm not trying to kill the testimony. That's a great testimony. I hope more people have that testimony. But if that's all you see, you miss the mark. Because God in Christ has made you a new creation. He has made you righteous standing before God. He has made you holy standing before him. He has given you eternal life. He hasn't just fixed you a little bit in some areas of your life. He hasn't just fixed your anger. No, he makes you a new creation. Like, do you see the huge impact that this has? It's not, don't belittle salvation. Don't belittle it to, hey, I was this, but now I don't do these things. Only on a Saturday night event sometimes, right? No, the, God's testimony is, I have made you a new creation. I have made you completely new. And if you have believed in Christ, and I'm speaking to each one of you personally, if you have believed in Christ, you are a new creation. And if you have not believed in Christ, you have no idea what I've been talking about for the last 10 minutes, because you are not a new creation. And so in Christ, he offers us a new covenant, and in Christ, we are a new creation. And the last thing, Jesus gives us a new life. And so in John chapter 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, hey, in order for you to be in the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, again, questions this, but Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit. Don't marvel that I say you must be born again. You must be spiritually born again. Jesus gives us new life. And so two weeks ago, exactly two weeks ago, um, Again, by the grace of God, such a blessing was able to witness birth. Like, such a cool thing, man. New birth coming, new life coming into this world. And I look at this kid, and three things this kid does. Four. He eats, he poops, he sleeps, and every once in a while he burps. Oh, and he cries. And that's all this kid does. But this kid has his own body. He has his own soul. He has his own spirit. He has his own breath. He has his own life. It's not my life. It's not Yana's wife, life. It's not, right, it's, it's not our grand, her grandparents. It's not our parents' life. He has his own life. And this is, in a sense, what Jesus means when he says you must be born again. When we are born again spiritually, we are given new life. It's not someone else's life. It's not our parents' life. It's not my life for your life. It's not your life for my life. It's our own life. We are given new birth. We have our own life. 
And here's what Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 would say. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The life that Jesus gives, the new life that Jesus gives, it's not just in a spiritual way, but it's in a practical way. He gives us new life today. Since we've become a believer, since we've become that new creation, we walk in newness of life. And this life is not to please God because he has already been pleased by Jesus on the cross. It is not to avoid the wrath of God because God's wrath was already sacrificed on the cross. This new life that, Je- that Jesus gives, sorry, this new life that Jesus gives is a life that we walk in and these works that we live out, these things that we do for the glory of God, they are not to earn our salvation. They are because he has already given us salvation. You understand the difference. This is the point that I'm trying to draw in that we are not saved by being obedient or begrudgingly submitting ourselves to Christ. No, he has already saved us and now we live a life of obedience. Now we live a life that submits to him. And so have you been trying to earn the grace of God? Maybe you're not going to really say it to anybody because you know that that's not right, but have you been living like that? What do you do when you fall short and you sin? Do you run from God or do you run to God? That shows whether you understand the gospel. Because God as a father, loving his children, has dealt with sin And whenever we come short of that glory of God, we have access to him. Because of this new covenant, because we are a new creation, because we have a new life, we have a new access to God. And so have you been trying to earn the grace of God? Maybe before you repent, you try to clean yourself up a little, right? Or maybe before you come into church, you try to just sweep a couple of things under the rug so your conscience doesn't really bug you as much. But God offers clear repentance. And so three things that Jesus brings that are completely new. And by the way, I can talk about more things that Christ makes new. Because in the scripture we read that he gives us new heavens and a new earth. In scripture we read that he has this new Jerusalem and it is for the bride, it is for the church. In scripture we read about a new song. Man, this is crazy. Like hopefully I get a chance to talk about a sermon like this, about the new song. Because after salvation, so if God's people always sing, like always, throughout scripture, you will find singing everywhere. And singing is a good thing to do. Uh, I don't know if you like singing or if you don't like singing, but it is a really good thing to do, even if you really suck at it. Like, it is a great tool. But God's people always sing. They express themselves. And Jesus gives this new song. And so you see this teaching, this old way of life that the Pharisees had. By works we can earn salvation. This old teaching, Jesus presses against it and he offers this newness. Everything is made new. And in Revelation, he even himself says, I am making all things new. Not I am making some things new here in the church and everything else can go Away, but I am making all things new. I am redeeming all creation. Everything is made new in Christ. And so I finish with this Romans 12 to 2, Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable. And perfect. 
how you think about salvation, what you think about Jesus matters. You know who talks to you the most in your life? It's you. (laughs) You talk to yourself more than anybody else talks to you. You wake up and you're talking to yourself. You're saying, I'm either hitting the snooze or I don't want to get out of bed. But you're talking to yourself and guess what? You're listening to yourself. Right? The The two go hand in hand. And so look at this verse. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. There's that word, that new, renewal of your mind. Preach to yourself. Learn to preach to yourself. When you are in a spot where you know that what you are either about to do or have done or where you're going, like it just doesn't feel right, Learn to preach to yourself. Learn to preach to yourself the grace of God. Learn to preach to yourself, hey, I am a new creation. I have been given new life. I have already been saved. And walk in that newness. Walk in what Christ has done for you. And so, if we can, let's bow our heads for a little bit. And I want to ask you some questions. And as the worship band will come up, we'll consider a couple of things. I want you to look back and think to a time in your life when, like it was the lowest point in your life. Look back and think of the time in your life when you felt the worst, when a tragedy has happened, when you've committed something that you think is unforgivable. And I want you to read in your minds, or just listen, Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were at our worst, Jesus died for us. And the old way of life, the old teaching, no matter where you've gone, no matter where you've been, is forgiven on the cross. And you walk in that newness You have a new covenant with Jesus. You have a new, you are a new creation in Christ. You have new life in Christ. He has prepared a new heaven and a new earth for you. He has given you a new song to sing. He has redeemed his people. And so, man, if if I'm saying these things and you're going, I hear it. And I believe it, but man, I don't know if I really believe it. We have life group leaders in the back. We're going to have people in the back. You come and you pray with somebody. And you don't wait till next week because you know the same offer will happen. And you don't wait till June or July, but you come today and you go, I want to walk in the newness that Jesus offers. Father, we thank you for the grace that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for the love that you show for your people. God, you have made us new, completely new. You have made us a people who aren't just morally good or we do good things every once in a while. No, you have made us a people who are righteous before you, eternal before you. God, I pray for those of us who do not know or do not uh, believe in these things. Holy Spirit, I pray that you break that down. That you work in our lives. That you show us that you have made us new. And God, let us worship you. Let us worship you as if and because we do have that new song. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
As we go into this time of worship, anytime during the next three songs, um, if you want to go back and pray with somebody, there will be life group leaders and Igor in the back. Um, it's not an embarrassing thing to do. It's actually a sign of strength. It shows that you actually want to change and that you actually want to know God more. So um, there's going to be no judgment back there. If you want to talk to someone, um, share your deepest secret. Um, they're not going to tell anybody, okay? So just anytime during these three songs, if you want to go talk, please go do it.
for you, Lord, is never over. It's every day, every single second, every single minute of our lives, Lord. And as we head out into the world, let us just keep, let us just be mindful of what you've done for us, Lord, that we may truly seek to know who you are, Lord, that we may truly work on developing a true relationship with you, Lord, that we may give up our hearts to you, Lord, and that you may be able to look at and look into our hearts and know who we are and develop that relationship with us, Lord. And I pray that for those who are going through tough um, situations, tough, tough circumstances, Lord, that you guide them, that you that you remind them, Lord, that you're always there for them, Lord. Your your arms are always open for everyone and anyone, Lord. You are our Father. You are such a good God, Lord. And I just want to thank you and I want to praise you, Lord. In your name, we pray. Amen.